Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 18. The title of today's teaching is called, Where is your faith? This is a question that Jesus asked, and that's the question that he's asking us today. Where is your faith? Is your faith placed on what? What is your faith placed? And actually, what, where is your faith based on? Where is it standing on? And what kind of faith is that, actually? We should worship faith. Strong today, weak tomorrow faith. You know, doubtful faith. I'm not sure kind of faith. What kind of faith is it that you have? Jesus was asked the question in the book of Luke, and he says, where is your faith? Or he is looking for a particular faith, if you like. So we're going to look at that right now. If you have your Bibles open to the book of Luke, here's our text today. And I want us to read it out, read it out loud. I think it, read it loud out or whatever. <laughs> read it out loud together. <laughs> but that's just the second part of that Luke chapter 18, verse 8. Let's read it out loud to go. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Okay? How many... It, I say this is the second part. This is the B part of that. How many will he find here on earth who have faith? You know, when you think of that, when you read the scripture, when I, I used to read the scripture, I was thinking this faith he's talking about here is just the faith in terms of believing in Jesus. Okay. So in other words, he's saying, how many will still believe in me? That is actually not what he's talking about here, all right? He's actually talking about a particular kind of faith because we're going to read the scripture in context to see why he said what he said. God, in, in that same place, the amplified version, you get an, a glimpse of a glimpse of the kind of faith he was talking about. He wasn't talking about just how many will believe in me when I return. No. And the return here is not just about his coming back because he did return to meet the disciples. <laughs> he went away and he came back. So the return here include when I want to do anything here on earth, how many, will I, how many will I find who have faith? Look at it in the Amplified Version. It says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find, read, read that word underlined, persistent in faith on the earth. How many will he find persistent people in faith on the earth? Okay, let's just look at this context, okay? So that it's not King James making it up. Jesus then decided to tell a story before he said this. Let's look at the story he told. In the book of Luke chapter 18 from verse 1, he says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show them, to show that they should always pray and never give up. Okay? And never give up. He goes on to say, there was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. Let's pause for a minute. This judge in this picture is not a good man. Okay, so let's take note of that, because if you say a person who doesn't fear God is, is as good as an evil person, okay? And a person who doesn't care about people is actually, you can call him a wicked judge. Okay, that's a better word for that man. So there is, we could also now paraphrase a little bit, we can say there was a wicked judge in a certain city widow of that city came to him repeat, repeatedly saying, give me justice. Okay, so look at this. It's an interesting thing. A wicked man is about to give justice. So the, think about the strangeness of the story. Wicked person would not give right just judgment. That's, the, that's actually. So I want to show you the extreme picture Jesus wanted to paint in order to make a point. Because a wicked man 
will not give you, will give a biased, dodgy judgment. But nevertheless, this widow came to a wicked man to give a judgment, to, to, to make a judgment between her and her enemy. The judge ignores her for a while, but finally he, dis, he said to her, to himself, I don't fear God. So the man is admitting, I don't care about God. I don't care about people. I'm just a wicked person, basically. But this woman is driving me crazy. I am going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. All right? Constant request. The Lord said, that's Jesus now saying, learn a lesson from this unjust or if you like, wicked judge. What's the lesson here? Even he rendered a just decision. So a wicked person now did something right because this woman did not give up. Praise God. A wicked person could actually change their ways if the good person doesn't give up in doing good. Think about that now. In other words, if someone is hating you, do not join them in their hatred. Stay good. Keep doing the good because eventually that good wicked person more likely will turn to become good. But when you give in to evil, you're, you're giving up. Okay, let's move on. He says, so don't you think, don't you think God will surely give justice to his children cries out to him day and night, will he keep putting them off? Now, sometimes when we read the scripture, we use this on God. We try to use what Jesus is trying to say here on God. What do I mean by that? For example, um, we try to say, I have asked the Lord this, and God is, doesn't want to give me that. So I'm going to persist until God changes his mind. Friends, no, that's not what Jesus is trying to say here, okay? Why do I say that? Because he gave an example of a wicked person who doesn't want to help you, who doesn't care about you. The picture here is that God cares about you. He actually wants to give you justice already, okay? So the persistence here is not about whether God doesn't want to help you and you have to twist his arm to help you. No, no, no. God already wants to help you. But the point Jesus is trying to make is where he now said in verse 8, I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly, but when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Or if you like, who are persistent in faith? It starts, that parable starts as if Jesus is about to teach about prayer, but he ended up talking about faith. Praise God. Think with me. Number one, we've already established that God is not unjust. God wants to help you. God wants to heal you. God wants to bless you. God wants to heal that disease that they have told you that is a terminal. Because of, why, why can I say that? Because Jesus already has been striped. He has been beaten already. It's already done. So God wants to help you. God wants to save you and your wife and your children and your children's children. God wants to heal the world. God wants to restore nations. So the issue here is not going there Persisting in faith so that we can twist the ham, ham, hands of God. No. The issue here is persisting in order for the things that is coming against us and the things we are allowing on us to not distract us from the right focus of faith. Praise God. Now, many of us have faith. Many people have faith, but they have placed their faith in what? in science and, tech and economy. Many people's faith are placed in the political policies and human wisdom and strength. Oh, actually, in my, frame, <laughs> my opinion, the worst of this list I, I showed you there is the, the bottom one. When we place our faith 
in our own wisdom, that is more dangerous than placing our faith in political systems. Because if you place your faith in political systems or economy or science, one day you're going to wake up and say, this is wrong. Let me follow the right way. But if you think you know the best for yourself, if you think you know the best for your family, you know the best for your husband, you know the best, not God knows the best, but you, or even know the best for your own health, you know what you should do, you don't need God anymore. That's more dangerous than all this, where we place our faith. So what Jesus is trying to say here is, when I come back here again, when I want to do things here on earth, would I find people with the right kind of faith placed on the right person? The psalmist told us in the book of Psalms, verse chapter 33 from verse 16, he says, but the, the best weapon, the best armed army, the best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is a great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horses to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who, who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in the times of famine. He, we put our hope in the Lord, and he is our help and our shield. In him our heart rejoices, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, O Lord, for we, our hope is in you alone. Let's say that line with me. For our hope is in you alone. There is that part, that last word is actually so important. That last word, A-L-O-N-E, is the big one. We put our hope in you alone. That's the kind of faith Jesus was asking. When I come again, would I find faith here on earth? The lesson to be learned from this widow in Jesus' parable is that the widow believes that no one else can help her except the wicked judge. Think with me, friends. The man is wicked. The man is confessing to the woman. I don't care about you. I don't fear God. I don't care what God thinks about what I think about you. I just don't care. But the woman considers this man, this judge, as the only hope that she has. That's a lesson that is missed in that story. And so... It feels like Jesus is saying, when would I come to do something and do something through you guys? And it seems like your leg is here and you also have the other leg across the other end. And you cannot make up your mind what you're doing. One minute you believe in my miraculous healing power. Another minute you're so coward and afraid that I could heal. On Monday, I believe, I can't remember which day now, my friend Simon Teague um, called me, texted me to say that he had an accident. And nearly, I, I'm not going to share his testimony, but it was just dangerous. His neck is, he could have just be, ended up in, um, uh, what do you call it, intensive care with the fall, he, the fall he had. And by the time he, I called him, his necks hurt, his legs are hurting and everything. And the first thing I thought of when he said he could barely walk, the first thought that came to me while we were talking was, I remembered when I have these clutches in my garage. I remembered I have a clutches. So I wanted to offer him the clutches to make his crutch. Crutch, thank you, sorry. Crutches. I have a crutches when I did my knee surgery in my garage. So when he was talking to me, I thought, 
oh yeah, I'm going to, this is going on in my head while he's speaking. I'm going to give him my crutches just to make his, uh, so, so he can manage his pain. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, but the Lord heals. And, but the Lord heals. And then I said to him, can I pray for you right now? And he said, yes. Simple prayer. Father, we thank you because Jesus has taken our pains. Jesus has taken our sorrows. We give you praise for this. Thank you for healing Simon. Thank you for protecting him and making, making sure that he didn't snap his neck or end up worse than. We give you praise for everything. But right now we speak to that body, body be healed in the name of Jesus. And we finish speaking, praying that prayer, short prayer. And I said to him, don't worry, you're healed. Not because I was wishing to say it. I wasn't making up. I, the Holy Spirit was just speaking to me. And I was repeating what I was hearing from the Lord. And I said, don't worry, you're healed. Just begin to move your neck. We're going to move that. He carried on, did his own church. Texted me the next morning. Oh, I should have planned myself very well to read his text. And then woke up the next morning. No pain, no ankle that was, he could barely walk, healed completely. Simon will share his testimony later, by God's grace, another day whenever he's free. Completely healed. What is the point here that I'm trying to make? I'm trying to tell you how we sometimes act. My leg was, I had one leg on medical science, which is get a crutches and give him a crutches, let him manage his pain, even though I believe that God can heal. Now, am I saying that God doesn't use medicine? He does. But Jesus is asking, when I come here on earth, how many will I find in faith? This is a message that just hit me, and I realized, Jesus, I find myself, one minute I believe that you can heal, another minute I actually don't unknowingly trust in something else. One minute I believe that you can help me. Another minute I believe that, gosh, I'm doomed. One minute I believe this and I believe that. Friends, I hope God is speaking to you. This is not a condemning message in any shape or form. This is a message to just channel your faith again and remind you that until we come to the place where we say, it is only God alone that can help me. And I put my trust in him. Friends, that's the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. So let's going to give us three points today. I'm going to give us three points. So get a pen, get a pencil. The kind of faith Jesus is looking for. Amen. I hope that you are enjoying this so far because I'm getting blessed myself. God, we, two weeks ago, we, Pastor Ian Fox came and said to us, Favor House Church, it's time to rebuild. It's time to go. It's time to rebuild. God is speaking to us as a church. It's time to go. Last week, Pastor Henry came. He had a message in mind, but before he could start, the Holy Spirit changed the whole thing and said, no, no, no. Look, the harvest is plenty. Look, the harvest is ripe. Go, go. And all of them, none of them knew what God has put in our heart. God in a Fever House Church, Fever House Church, had to start an uh, evangelical meeting every once every month, and Jesus made it very clear to me: it is a healing meeting. It is a healing and prayer meeting. He said to me, "This is not." Said the saying to us, this is not a service. It's not just let's come and just do the same thing we normally do in church. No, this is a meeting where we come and we just let God touch his people, heal the sick, raise the dead, whatever. He will bring them. You will bring them. If you know anyone sick, bring them on the 8th of October, August, on the 7th of August, bring them to the St. Andrews. We'll start the advert very soon, but by next week. Bring them, not to King James, not to Cheesy, not to any of the leaders here. It's to God because he will heal them. Praise God. This is the time where we no longer, that, you know, afraid with our faith. No, Jesus is looking for a faith-based people whose faith is our only in him. Amen. None of these pastors who were speaking to us knew 
what God was saying to us. So when we finished, we told Pastor Henry, he was absolutely spot on. The message he gave us, the same with Pastor Ian. So friends, Jesus is asking us a question. Where is your faith? So this is the kind of faith that Jesus, the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. Number one, a steadfast faith. A steadfast faith is a decisive and committed faith. A decisive and committed faith. Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 21. Now early in the morning, as Jesus was going back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing along a lone, seeing a lone fig tree, sorry about that, at the roadside, he went to it and found nothing but leaves. He found what? Nothing but leaves. Give me, do me a favor. Give me the basketball. He found nothing but leaves. And he said to it, never again will this fruit, never again will fruit come from you. And at once the fig withered, fig tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were astonished and asked, how is it that the fig tree has withered away all at once? Jesus replied to them, I assured you, and most solemnly say to you, if you have faith, that what does that mean? Personal trust and confidence in me. Praise God. Faith, personal trust, and confidence in me, and do not doubt or allow yourself to be drawn in two directions. Praise God. Do not allow yourself to be drawn. I wish you could see my legs, guys, in two directions. Stand by the fence. No, he doesn't want you standing by the fence. He wants you all the way. He wants me all the way. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mountains, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will be it will happen if God wills it. That's a very important part, by the way. So we're not talking about asking what is not part of God's will. But I don't want to distract you right now. So it has to be part of God's will. We know. But most times we are even talking about in the area where we know is God's will, we're still double-minded. Praise God. And he goes on to say, whatever you ask for in prayer, believing. That means having that personal trust and confidence in me, you will have that thing. I um, <laughs> Steadfast faith means decisive and committed. The word committed here is very important. I didn't think this was going to happen to me, but it did. Um, I think I was listening to Pastor Steve Opo when we went to a conference last week, um, and he shared a story about his children talking about commitment. But let me, and they said that one of the reasons why the, his children told him this is a bit of a bicycle extreme sports and things like that, and his children told him, and, he, and they were sending him videos of, of um, people who make this, of them making some of the crazy jumps with a bicycle. And Pastor Steve was talking about, that's Steve Oppo, was talking about how they watch this kind of thing. So I don't know if, you, if you're here in UK, you watch it, you've been framed and things like that. You see how people ride a bicycle and they go and crash themselves and all kinds of crazy things. It's just difficult to watch, although sometimes funny. <laughs> Maybe funny because it's not happening to you. But anyway, and the student is like, struggling to watch his children do those things. And the student said, Daddy, you don't need to worry. Why? The reason, and they said to him, the reason why those people crash is because they are not fully committed. That when you are fully committed, you make the jump. So here's my personal experience. So Duke got this birthday gift. Basketball court you're looking at on the side there. Basketball hoop, whatever it's called. 
I set it up for him. On Monday, I think I was a bit tired. It wasn't necessarily this ball I used. It was another just normal football. I just felt like going out there to throw some hoops. So I went there and then tried to throw some hoops, looking at that picture you're seeing. So as you could see in that picture, across it is a fence. And of course, if you throw it too much, it will go beyond that fence. And so I kept on shooting and I couldn't even make one basket. I think I went up to 15, if not 20 times. Nothing, 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 nothing. It was so embarrassing. And in between doing that, guess what I remembered? I remembered what Pastor Steve said about his children. And I thought, am I not committed? I said, yes, I'm not. I was more concerned about the ball going over the fence because I was so tired I couldn't be bothered crossing the fence to go and pick up the ball. So every time I was ready to throw the basket, I was hesitating last minute without knowing that I was hesitating because my mind, somewhere in my mind, was lodged, do not lose the ball. And so I'm throwing, but I don't want to lose the ball. Friends, this is exactly what happens to us. But let me just finish the story first. Because I throw, and I don't want to lose the ball. It's like what we do. I want to prophesy, but I don't want to be embarrassed. Okay? I, 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 I want to pray for the sick, but what if they're not healed? <laughs> I want to start that business, but what if it fails? So constantly, I'm about to throw, but I'm, I say again, 15 or 20 times. And immediately I had this thought. I say, okay, it seems like I'm not committed. Friends, I just stood up there and I said, I don't care if this ball goes over the fence to the road and damage a car or get smashed. I don't care anymore. Bounce, bounce, whoop, basket, whoop, basket, whoop, basket, whoop, basket, what, whoop, basket, what, whoop, basket. Immediately I saw that, I took a picture, I said, this is what God was saying to me. When I come here on earth, how many on earth would I find with steadfast faith, a decisive faith, and fully committed to what they believe? A decisive, you believe that God will help your children and you're fully committed to it. Not one day you believe God will help them, and another day you see how they misbehave, and you're afraid, oh my God, God, what will happen to my child? What will happen to this, my son? No, steadfast and committed that God will help me. Amen. Steadfast Amen. and committed that God will help your marriage. Amen. Steadfast committed that God will build your business. Steadfast committed that God will help the, your, heal your body. Steadfast committed, no matter how long it takes, that disease you're suffering will not win. Amen. Praise God. Jesus is asking you, are you decisive and committed? That's the kind of faith he's looking for. James told us in the book of James, thank you for this. James told us in the book of James, he says, dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. So there's a reason for trouble, but we don't want trouble. And it says, for you know that when your faith is tested, ah, that's what the reason for the trouble is. The reason why you can rejoice because your body has fallen weak is actually is a test of just your faith, whether your faith is steadfast. How do I know? Because it says your endurance has a chance to grow. All of a sudden, now your faith can grow. All of a sudden, you can grow your steadfastness in faith. And Bible now says in verse 4, he says, let it grow. Amen. Don't chicken out from the trouble. Don't try to chicken out, oh, God, if you're not healing me, then there's something wrong. No, no, there's nothing wrong. God has everything in control. He says, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And he goes on to say, and if you need wisdom, I love this part, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. 
he will not rebuke you for it. Let me say something on this point. Why is James all of a sudden talking about staying in faith and being enduring, and all of a sudden start talking about wisdom? You know what he means there? He says, if you need wisdom, in other words, all you need is not doubting God, but what you need is ask him, okay, now God, what do you want me to do? Okay, how do you want me to deal with it? That's wisdom. Remember, wisdom is application of knowledge. Application of knowledge. So he says, if I am, for example, I am struggling with my business. Okay? Instead of doubting that God was never the one that told you to start that business, why don't you just ask God for wisdom? Say, God, okay, fine. I'm never going to doubt you, but what do you want me to do? Father, the church you have committed into my hands to lead, it seems like nothing is happening. I'm not going to doubt that you never called me. I'm only asking you, tell me what to do. That's why James is saying, ask for wisdom. Praise God. He goes on to say, but when he asks, here is the crunch here, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. Do not have your leg on one side, or like me, throwing the basketball, one minute I'm going to throw it, and I'm thinking about losing the ball. Make sure that your faith is settled, because a person with divided loyalty is as unstable or unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And it goes on, finally says, their loyalty is divided between God and the world. Are we steadfast in faith? That's the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. Let's move on because of time. Jesus is asking us, where is your faith today? And he's not just asking about just, do you believe in me? No, he's asking about steadfast faith. And the second kind of faith he's asking for is a persistent faith. I've already read the scripture for us in the book of Luke, where we started, Luke chapter 18. And the steadfast faith is a courageous and defiant faith. It's the kind of faith that doesn't just take a no for an answer. It's the kind of faith that shuts out, shuts out the outside noises and what everybody else thinks. It's a kind of faith that comes to that place where it's personal. It's me and God and what he has said to me. I don't care if everybody else don't understand me, but God understands me and I'm sticking to it. That's a steadfast, that's a persistent faith. That's what that woman did. But there is another place in the scripture, I believe will also encourage us to show us a picture of courageous and being courageous and defiant in faith. Friends, the Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 18, in the same chapter, Luke, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. And the Bible says, when he heard the noise of the crowd going past, he asked what is, was happening. They told him, Jesus the Nazarene was going by. Take note of the word, the Nazarene, so he knew the kind of, the, which Jesus. It's not just any Jesus, okay? He, in other words, when they said Jesus the Nazarene was going by, he realized, ah, I've heard of this Jesus before. This Jesus is the one that heals the sick, cast out demon, raise the dead. So if that Jesus is the one going by, guess what I'm going to do? Watch it. Bible says, and so he began to do what? Scream, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He is persistent. Bible said, they said to him, be quiet. The people in front yelled because he's behind them and shouting. But guess what the man did? He <laughs> no, but he only shouted louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's what we call persistent faith. Not always do we persist when we face oppositions like that. Sometimes we listen to outside noise. This, that is a noise from the people. The word that says be quiet is noise. 
When God says to you, I will, I will make you, I'm going to raise you up to be a, a, an influence in this community. And then someone comes around and says, but you haven't even done anything. But well, who, who are you? That's an outside noise. That's be quiet. It's now, God is looking now, what Jesus is now looking for. Are you persistent in what I have told you? This is not persistent in trying to twist God's hands. No, it's what he's already trying to do through you. Be persistent in that. Friends, I did not, I was not always persistent. There but also were times where I was persistent. For example, I had a friend who I respected and he um, told me, a pastor friend actually, much older than I am, but growing up he told me I was I would come out and lead choir, worship song and things like that. And um, but before I would lead worship song, you know, I would take up the microphone and I will introduce the worship song, and, you know, choir song and then you sing. And then one day this pastor, trying to help me, just like the people were trying to help the beggar, by the way, they were trying to help him. That's what help is. So he was trying to help me and he said to me, um, can I speak to you? I said, yeah. He said, uh, anytime you um, got given a mic to sing, just sing. Speaking is not for you. This is, this is, you don't have the skill, you don't have the strength, ability. You don't know what you're saying, just, but you're good at singing, very good at singing. Just stick to singing. Friends, I did not persist. I went with what he said. And for many years, I believed I cannot speak. Even so much so that when God called me, started so one day said to me on the stage, one day you'll be speaking just like that pastor is speaking. I actually fought with God. I resisted. I said to God, unless an angel appears physically, that will not happen. And the Lord rebuked me badly. I cried and cried on that stage. People didn't know why I was crying. But I was crying in repentance because I have listened to the outside noise. But there was also another person who tried to advise me and tell me, um, your worship is a little bit over the top. The good friend of mine told me those days as a teenager. Why is that she saying that? I was the kind of person that in between worship, God would say to me, when everybody else is like this, I don't know why. God will say to me, just lift up your hands to me. And it takes courage because everybody else is doing something different. But persistence and defiance means that you have to do what God is saying to you, whether everybody else is going the other way. Praise God. And sometimes God will say to me, kneel down, when no one else is kneeling down. And sometimes God will say to me, lie on the floor for me. And I will lie on the floor when no one else is doing it. Why is God taking me through that as a teenager? He was trying to get me to believe and trust him. And usually when I follow him that way, there is signs and wonders. But so this friend told me, your worship is too much. That's the exact word she used. Your worship is a bit too much. And I do, what do you mean by that? She says, it feels like show. It feels like you're always doing a show. Could you tone it down? I'm glad I didn't listen. Because today I will still be trying to find my emotions for God. I'll be like the men that say, no, no. Men doesn't worship God. Men don't cry. And they go to a football stadium. <laughs> My team lost. <laughs> and they will cry on the stadium, but they come to church and they cannot connect with God. I would have been like that if I had listened to that advice. And worshiping God is one of my favorite things to do. I connect with him through songs. Friends, you've got to have to be defiant. So the blind beggar was. He said, they said to him, be quiet. Guess what he said? <laughs> you think I'm going to be quiet? Jesus, son of David. That's the kind of faith Jesus is coming for. Yeah. Persistent faith. Yeah. When Jesus heard that man speaking, he, shout, he stopped and um, ordered that the man be brought to him. As the man came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do, Lord? And what do you want me to do? Lord, he said, I want to see. Friends, just quick, quick, quick point here. Don't want to distract you from the main thing. 
when I'm talking about being persistent in God or in faith, you're trying to push away the outside noise. It's not God you're trying to push. Praise God. Okay, let me, ex- let me give you an example. There are times you don't feel close to God. There are times you don't feel like worshiping. There are times you don't feel like praying. There are times you don't feel like reading the Bible at all. That's where you need resistance, persistence, okay? Because that's the outside noise. That's your flesh and every other thing trying to stop you from reaching to God. So therefore, guess what you need to do? Play some worship song. That's being persistent. Force yourself and say, you know what? I'm going to, that's persistent. Fair. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to just get up from my bed and just kneel on my ground and say, God, help me. God, help me. That's where you be persistent. But when you end up in his presence, make it simple. Keep it simple. Like the man. I just want to see. Praise God. Once you've cut out through the noise, when you come to God and say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. Amen. And he will help you. And Jesus said, all right, receive your sight, your faith. What healed him? What healed him? Say it yourself. Your faith. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Your faith has healed you. I cannot explain it. Jesus knew what he was saying. But I would take Jesus by his word. That the man's persistent faith is what healed him. Why can one one say that the faith of the man healed him? Because Jesus said us in another place, there is nothing impossible for those who believe. And there is nothing impossible with God. Praise God. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus, praising God and all who saw it praised God too. We're going to go to the third point and soon we close. The final point is final kind of faith Jesus is looking for is a victorious faith. A victorious faith. A victorious faith is a love-driven, compassionate faith. Let me explain that now, or say that again. (laughs) A love what? Driven. The only thing that wins is something that could last forever. Amen. You know, we say winners don't quit. Quitters don't win. To be victorious, your faith has to be made of something that can outlast anything else. Bible says, guess what? Faith, hope, and what? Love will last forever. So a love-driven faith is a victorious faith. The Bible tells us that in the book of James, John, 1 John chapter 5, he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. See that? Love God, love his children. And if if we know we love God's children, if we love God and obey his commandment. Now, obeying God's commandment should come from where? Love for God. And that's the point here. So it's not about just obey him and then hopefully you're going to love him. No, 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 no. Love God. Let your love bring you to that place where you obey God, not the other way. Obey God and hopefully you're going to begin to love him. Okay? So ask God to help you to come to that place of love in your heart for him. And he will do that. The more you connect with Jesus, the more you connect to love his children, the more you love God. And he says, loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And now the tell now tells us in chapter verse four, every child of God defeats this world. And we achieve this victory through what? Our faith. So our faith is a victorious faith. The kind of faith that God has given you is a victorious faith, but it's a faith that is based on loving God and his people. That's the point. A victorious faith is a faith that is drilled and made up of sugar-coated or whatever you want to call it, filled with love for people. And it says, and who can win the battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
Praise God. Bible tells us as well that in Galatians chapter 5 verse 6, it says, For when we place our faith in Christ, there is no benefit. When we place our faith in Christ, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important, say that with me, is faith expressing itself in love. Faith expressing itself in love. It means that my trust in, for God to help me, my trust for God to heal someone, my prayer is based in the love for that person and the love for God. So whatever it is I'm asking God for, whatever it is you're believing for, let it be based, let it be expressed in love. Love for God and love for his children. You cannot disconnect yourself from God's children and say, I don't care, I'm going to heaven. That will not be a victorious faith. And that's not the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. Now, I'm not here standing here telling anyone you're not going to go to heaven if you believe in Jesus. No, I said the scripture started by saying to us, anyone who believes that Jesus is the son of God is a child of God already. So if you're, all you want is just a faith to go to heaven, believe in Jesus. Okay, that's fine. That's you. Fine. But that's not the kind of faith Jesus was asking when he says, when I come here on earth, will I find faith? He was asking for a persistent faith, a steadfast faith. And he's also asking for a victorious faith. In other words, a faith that is driven by love for God and love for his people. Friends, as we come to end this message, God wants you to place your faith in Christ alone. God wants us to place our faith in Christ alone. Let's, let, let, let me just show us a, a picture here. I, I saw this in my Bible, a, diff, a, a explanation of faith in my Bible. It says that faith is pistis. That's a Greek word for it. It says pistis. It says conf, conviction, conf, confidence, trust, belief, reliance, trustworthiness, persuasion in the new a, a testament setting. In the New Testament setting, pistis, which is faith, is divinely implanted principle. It's a divinely implanted principle of inward confidence and assurance, trust and reliance in God and all that he says. Trust in God and all that he said. If he says, I will heal you, have your faith in that. Don't have your leg in one corner and then the other corner. If he says, go out and pray for the sick, go out and pray for the sick. Don't throw the basket hoop like me, thinking, holding back. Be fully committed to that and you will see the, heal, the sick healed. When you go out to the street to preach the gospel, be fully committed that God will save the lost. Don't go haphazard there and say, maybe, hopefully, you never know. No, kill all of that. And I am complicit on this. Many of us are just haphazard. We are not fully committed. We are not steadfast in our faith. We are not persistent in our faith. And we are not fully um, exhibiting a victorious faith, which is a faith filled with love for people and love for God. We want to end today by asking God to help us in that area. John told us finally, he says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know no, there means completely have understanding for. You have eternal life. This is not about whether you're going to, you have eternal life. It's settled. But he now goes on to say, and we know, and we are confident that we, he hears us. When, whatever we ask for, whenever we ask for anything that pleases him, he hears us. Have confidence that God hears you. Not Pastor King James, that God hears Pastor King James or hears, uh, you know, Pastor Cheesy or whoever else. No, have confidence that God hears you, you, you. This is a message for you. And then, and since you, we know he hears us, since you know he hears you, when you make a, your request, personalize it. When I make my request, I also know that he will give me what I ask. Let's read that, personalize as I close. Since I know that God hears me, when I make my request, I also know that he will give me what 
I ask for. Why? Because I place my faith in Christ alone. I love you all, and I'll see you sometime next week. Cheesy will lead us in a time of worship and pray for us. But let God, let the work of the Holy Spirit carry on in your heart throughout this week and this message you've received. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. He is looking for persistent, um, um, steadfast, persistent, and victorious faith. And let him find that in you. Christ Jesus, find that in me. In the name of Jesus. God bless you all.